Chapter 1 In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, an herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat." and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. 
and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Genesis 2 Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day, and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. for the Sabbath, but Sabbath for the man. That the man is a more important issue, not the day, but the man. Are you following what I'm saying to you? He is the new covenant. It's all about him. It's not about keeping this rule or that rule or keeping that day or that day. It's about Jesus. Now, Jesus never said a word about keeping the Sabbath that we can read in the New Testament. And the Sabbath was made so that we can rest. It's the time, yes, to worship God, but it doesn't mean it's, it's the day for going to church. Are they preaching like Abel or preaching like Cain? Matter of weeks, we are looking at the coming of Jesus Christ immediately. It is imminent. Get ready. <laughs> Observe the Sabbath day. Observe means to do more than remember. Observe means you physically go to God's house to worship Him, to praise Him, to clap your hands, O you people, and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. This is His day. This is His house. We are His created. He is our provider. He is our defender. He is our high tower. He is our Father which is in heaven, and He's worthy of our highest praise. Give Him praise in the house. What you do Monday through Saturday is for the physical man. What you do on Sunday, which I call the Lord's Day, is for the spiritual man. Many of you watching television right now cannot find a church in your area that preaches the Word of God. Join our church family by sitting in front of that television with your family, with the Bible, receiving the Word of God. For where two or three of you are gathered together, God is in that place. We are united by the power of the Holy Spirit. Forgetting the arguments about whether or not we have to keep the Sabbath commandment or any of the other commandments, a simple question. In Genesis 2, verse 3, it says that God blessed the seventh day. Where in Scripture do we read that blessing being taken off of the day? When did God ever unbless the day? Everybody knows he never unblessed the day. But when you're going to just follow what your pastor says, who's just following what his teachers told him, then you don't really care to look into these questions, do you? When was the blessing ever taken off the seventh day? Answer, never. If thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments, Christ said in Matthew 19, verse 17. Not that that earns you your salvation, but it is a condition. Repentance is a condition. Belief in Christ is a condition. When was the blessing ever taken off of the seventh day? It never was. Have a blessed, joyous Sabbath, everyone. Peace all, bye-bye. Now, since we're going to be talking a lot about sin, that ugly little word sin, let's go to our Bibles and find a very simple, clear definition of sin that all of us can agree on. 1 John 3, verse 4. I do not know of any more succinct definition of sin in the Bible than this. 1 John 3, 4. It says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is a transgression of the law. Now, isn't that plain? It says sin is a breaking of the law. You say, but Brother Joe, I don't know what law that's talking about. What does that mean? What does it refer to? Let's go back now to Romans 7, verse 7, and let Paul explain to us exactly which law is involved here in this 
in this act of sin. Paul says in Romans 7, 7, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. And he quotes right out of the Ten Commandments. The one that a lot of modern theologians have simply thrown out the window. Paul didn't know anything about it being old-fashioned or out of date or irre irrelevant, did he? No, no. He said, look, I wouldn't even know what sin was if I didn't have that law of the Ten Commandments to speak to me. So what law then do you think John was talking about when he said sin is a transgression of the law? Well, he was talking about the same one that Paul wrote of here, saying that he wouldn't even know what sin was unless he also had the law. Now, please don't misunderstand me tonight, friends. There are some things that the law can do for us, and there are some things that it can't do for us. For example, it won't save us, will it? I mean, works will not justify anybody before God. That is not God's way of saving men, to have a struggle and try and work our way to heaven. No, no, no. The Bible says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's a gift of God. No, no, we're justified by faith, friends. We are never saved by being good or by working hard or by keeping the commandments or obeying the laws of God. No, no, it is a free gift from God that we're saved. on Mount Sinai is absolutely insane. Confío en Buda. Creo en Dios. Creo en Jesucristo. Creo en Dios. Allah. Muchos piensan distinto, sienten distinto, buscan a Dios o encuentran a Dios de diversa manera. En esta multitud, en este abanico de religiones, hay una sola certeza que tenemos para todo. Religious leaders are gathering November 6th through the 18th for a ceremony they're calling Returning to Sinai, where they say that they're going to issue a new Ten Commandments to repent for man-made climate change. The website Interface Center for Sustainable Development has an article discussing the upcoming event titled In Sinai, a Prophetic Call for Climate Justice and Ceremony of Repentance. Mount Sinai is of course where Moses received the Ten Commandments, but these religious leaders are actually calling for a new universal Ten Commandments. Todos somos hijos. De Dios. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Que el diálogo sincero entre hombres y mujeres de diversas religiones conlleve frutos de paz y justicia. The final stage is being set in November 2022, and it will ultimately lead to the one world religion. This year, the Holy Father's message implores the world: listen to the voice of creation and hear its bittersweet song, sweetly praising the Creator, bitterly lamenting our mistreatment of nature. Very worried about this mis mistreatment, the Holy Father calls for bolder action from all nations during this year's COP27 and COP15 summits on climate change and biodiversity. Regarding COP27, Pope Francis again joins scientists in holding to the Paris Agreement's temperature increase goal of 1.5 degrees. The planet already is 1.2 degrees hotter. During this season of creation, may all Christians come together to celebrate the creation's sweet song and respond to creation's bitter cry. The 7th Congress of Leaders of Wild and Traditional Religions started in Kazakhstan's capital, Nur Sultan. 
Pope Francis is among the guests, as well as high representatives of various religions. One of the goals of this Congress is to promote peace through dialogue. It's absolutely necessary to have a dialogue on the challenges of this world and to have a strong collective call for peace and justice in this world as well. The key for peace today in this unstable world is to engage, to talk, to be together, to try to understand each other and to know personally each other and that's what can bring people together. This year's Congress brings together delegates from more than 50 countries representing different world religions. To compare with the first Congress, uh, there were only 17 delegations. Now we have more than 100 delegations. So it uh, shows uh, that uh, there is an interest in the world and there is a support of the spiritual leaders. The most important thing that is being achieved here is to normalize the conversation between different religions through their religious leaders. It is to make it popular and important for religious leaders to come together as one, which is very rare and we don't see it very frequently, but it essentially normalizes the space of convening between different religions. And in our times and in our world, that's very important. Many global challenges were raised at this Congress and the pandemic was one of them. Some of the participants said that the pandemic has clearly shown how connected human beings are, stressing that this is something many seemed to forget. Galina Church traditions that clash with the Word of God. Yes, there are. Be careful the crowd you run with. Be careful the church teachings and practices you run with. That is a pivotal lesson. That is a relevant lesson. Be careful the church teachings and practices that you run with. There are some man-made church traditions that are contrary to the Word of God. One of them is Sunday observance, Sunday sacredness. It's not in the Bible. As you scan the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you will not find one single verse that tells us to honor the first day of the week. You say, but Mark, Jesus rose from the tomb on the first day of the week, Sunday. Absolutely. And Jesus, by virtue of rising from the tomb on the first day, reinforced why we should rest on the seventh day. Jesus rested in the tomb on the seventh day Sabbath. So there's no evidence in scripture for Sunday sacredness. Where did it come from? It came from the Roman Catholic Church. It is a church tradition that clashes with the word of God. And so tonight we're challenged to go to the word of God. Jesus said, but he answered and said unto them, why do you also transgress what? The commandment of God by your tradition. So you think, let's plug it in. But he answered and said unto them, why do you also transgress the commandment of God, including the Sabbath, by your Sunday tradition? In vain, when we know better, that is when we know better, in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And so in the time of Christ, they were putting church traditions above the Bible. Is that happening in our day? Yes, it is. And so are there some popular dangerous deceptions now in the Christian church? There are many. Are there some popular church traditions that clash with the Ten Commandments of God? I repeat, Sunday observance. Should you follow or run with those who are trampling on the Sabbath? Take your Bible and turn with me to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter uh, 58. Are you ready to learn some things tonight? I'd rather save one with the truth and the Holy Ghost than comfort 10,000 in their self-deception. And we fail our people when we water down and compromise and undermine and repudiate. The message God has given to us to bear and to live.
underpins of world order is always the financial system. Mm. Uh, I was very privileged. My father was an advisor to Nixon when they came off the gold standard in 71, and so I was brought up with a kind of inside view of how very important the financial structure is to absolutely everything else. And what we're seeing in the world today, I think, is we are on the brink of a dramatic change where we are about to, and I'll say this boldly, we're about to abandon the traditional system of money and accounting and introduce a new one. And the new one, the new accounting, is what we call blockchain. It means digital. It means having an almost perfect record of every single transaction that happens in the economy, which will give us far greater clarity over what's going on. It also raises huge dangers in terms of the balance of power between states and citizens. In my opinion, we're going to need a digital constitution of human rights if we're going to have digital money. Uh, but also, this new money will be sovereign in nature. Most people think that digital money is crypto and private, but uh, what I see are superpowers introducing digital currency. The Chinese were the first. The U.S. is on the brink, I think, of moving in the same direction. The Europeans have committed to that as well. And the question is, will that new system of digital money and digital accounting accommodate the competing needs of the citizens of all these locations so that every human being has a chance to have a better life? It was a rare moment. Pope Francis alone praying. He placed a rose atop the etched names of the 3,000 victims of the 9-11 attacks. His goal, bringing people together. The pontiff chose this place to promote worldwide peace. The pope joined hundreds of leaders of different faiths to talk about healing. Together, he led a prayer of peace for a violent world. Peace in the hearts of all men and women and peace among the nations. He says he witnessed Pope Francis gracefully combining two contrasting passions in his effort to bring all religions together. To bring all religions together. The words may sound different, but the Pope gathered them into one voice for peace. Papa Francesco, on behalf of this very distinguished group, representatives of the Hindu, Buddhist, Jain, Sikh, Native American, Jewish, Islamic, and Christian communities of New York City, our civic and public officials, and the board of the September 11th Memorial Foundation, I renew to you our welcome and our joy at your visit. Welcome, Holy Father. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest. Although the works were finished, from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? 
there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need.